Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Good morning, everyone. It is Saturday, October the 15th, 2022. It is currently 1013 a.m. Central Time, and I'm coming to you live from the Theology Central studio located right here in Abilene, Texas, where the sound of my voice, do you, does it sound energetic? Does it sound exciting? Well, if you think it does, that's because I'm a great actor, right? I am pretending right now that I'm excited. I am pretending right now that I'm energetic, that I'm looking forward to the next hour plus of live broadcasting. But the reality is inside, I'm like, no, don't do it. No, don't, don't, don't run, run, destroy the microphone, smash the laptop. Don't, don't stab yourself in the neck with a fork so that you can't talk. Okay, maybe that's a little bit of extreme. But the point is, I don't want to do this because we're about to enter in, we're about to enter into, I don't know, a spiritual wasteland, an apocalypse. I I, I don't know, some horror movie. It, it, I, I don't really know. And I know you think I'm being oh no. If you've been with us in this series, you know that I'm not exaggerating. You know that I'm understating everything. I'm not overreacting. I'm understating everything. Okay, okay. You're like, I don't know what's going on. What did I just walk into? I've never heard this broadcast before. Well, let, let me explain what's going on. We've been reviewing sermons that was preached at a youth conference in the summer of 2022. This conference was held in the state of Indiana. We now realize that the state of Indiana is a really bad place and everyone should move from the state of Indiana and no one should even drive. Like if you're driving, you're on vacation and you're driving and, and all of a sudden you say, Indiana, 10, 10 miles ahead, stop the car. I don't care if you have to drive through a field. I don't care if you have to drive around cows, whatever you have to do, drive around the entire state, fly over it, dig under it, drive around. Okay, um, okay. Because <laughs> this youth conference that we've been reviewing has been absolutely traumatizing. It has been so bad the way they've, no, not it's not the way they've handled scripture. It's the lack of even attempting to handle scripture in any meaningful way, making the text say things completely opposite to what the text actually says, just using the text as a pretext to really engage in, in emotional manipulation of young people. It's been absolutely the most absurd thing I, I think I have heard in a very, very long time. Maybe maybe the most absurd thing I've ever heard in my life. It's, that's how bad it's been. And I thought we were done. Oh, I thought we were done. I thought it was, you know, now safe to turn on the microphone again. And just when I thought that, <laughs> no, 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 no. I realized there was one message left. The concluding message of the youth conference that was held in Hammond, Indiana, the summer of 2022. And what is frightening is this thing is in one hour and 17 minutes long. And as crazy as the last message was, I have no idea what we are in store for. I have no idea. Now you say, you should know. No, I I shouldn't know because I don't review things. I don't review things beforehand. I like the review. I like our analysis to be like we're sitting down together, listening to it in real time together. You, the first time you hear it is the first time I hear it so that our reaction is real and organic. And this doesn't come across as something rehearsed and staged, but it's very real. So I don't know. I, I, I don't know what's going to happen, but it's an hour and 17 minutes long. There's no way we're going to get this reviewed in this episode. That means we're going to have to do two episodes on this unless for some weird reason that a part of this is either just si- like they left the, the 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 recording going or it just kind of breaks down into just singing and then there's nothing to review. I don't know what's getting ready to happen, but we're going to try to bring this to, a, I don't want to say a satisfying conclusion. I don't even want to say a dramatic conclusion. I think I, I just, I don't know what, I don't know what kind of a horrifying conclusion but that's where we're going. We're going to return to Indiana for the youth conference. That, and you're like, why are you reviewing this youth conference? You're picking on them? No. Uh, it was randomly chosen 
But not only that, this is very important. They themselves claim this is the most influential youth conference in the country, maybe in the world. Well, when you make a claim like that, well, then... I'm sorry, I would, I would be a foolish for anyone to ignore it. Hey, the most influential youth conference, we all need to pay attention because who is this influencing? How is this influencing? I want to know. Now, either their claim is truthful or their claim is just all hype. You can draw your own conclusion. But if you're going to claim that, then anyone associated with Christianity wants to know what's happening within Christianity as far as it comes to young people. And uh, I, I've been asking the question, what are three things we should be teaching young people? At this conference, I can't even really tell you what they've taught young people other than trying to emotionally abuse and manipulate them because that's what it has felt like. But here we go. <sighs> I'm going to take a deep breath. Just, a few minutes ago, I was walking through the living room and I just stopped in the middle of the living room and I, I did this. I just took a deep breath. <sighs> Time for the youth conference. And then I kept walking. Okay. So people thought I was probably crazy. Like, what, what, what's going on? But yes, it's, um, it's time. So I, I, I don't know what to tell you. If you have high blood pressure, you probably need to take your medication now. Um, I, I don't drink alcohol, but if there was ever a time to do so, okay, I'm joking. I'm joking. Here we go. I hope you're ready. The dramatic conclusion, part one, because it's probably going to be two parts. The dramatic conclusion of the youth conference that was held at First Baptist Church in Hammond, Indiana, in the summer of 2022. Here we are in October, still trying to process everything that was said. Here we go. My heart is full and... um it's like we work for a long time and then we come to this night and uh, the Lord's already done so much. I'm not sure what all I can add. The Lord has already done so much. Now, I got to stop right here. This brings up an interesting question. I, 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 Christians are, Christians fascinate me. And I know I, I sometimes speak of Christians or Christianity as if I'm on the outside and the reason I do so is because I don't think I've ever really felt, I don't think I really felt, I've ever really felt that I fit into Christianity. Like I'm always the odd man out. I don't fit in. I don't follow the templates. I hate the tribalism. I'm not going to, I don't care about your team. You're not on our team. You know, I don't care about your teams. I don't care about your tribalism. I don't care about your templates. I don't care about anything that you tell me that I'm supposed to do. I'm, I'm going to operate outside of all of that. I, and I know that that, that may not, that's, that's brought, obviously hindered my ministry. And that's probably why I'm in a small church in the middle of nowhere, because I wouldn't be accepted in any other church. I'd be fired in 5.2 seconds. I mean, just imagine me at your church. I mean, if you've listened to this broadcast for any length of time, you know I would be fired at your church in 5.2 seconds. You may even be like, look, I like you as a podcaster, but if you were at my church, I would fire you in seconds. I understand that. But I, but, but I, so I always feel like I'm on the outside and I think, and because, and I think Christians sometimes don't see the absurdity of what they do, right? Again, you get, and I'll just give you some examples. Christians love to spiritualize everything, right? Everything we do, we so spiritualize it, even when there's no reason to spiritualize it. I'll give you an example. It's Saturday. So there will be lost people getting together on a Saturday night. They'll sit around. They maybe they play games. Maybe, maybe, maybe they'll do some sinful activity. But the point is they're going to get together and hang out. Some are not going to be doing anything sinful. They're going to hang out. Maybe they're going to, maybe they're going to cook, have a cookout, play some games, whatever. They're going to get together. Now they're just going to call it a get together. They may call it a party. But Christians get together doing the exact same activities. And all of a sudden we call it fellowship. We've got to spiritualize it. We've got to spiritualize it uh, because I don't know why, but we, we, it makes us feel more spiritual, more godly. I don't know. But we, we're, we're very, it's very weird. And so Christians love to do this. You know, oh, God was moving. God did this. God was doing amazing things. And sometimes you're just like, I think you are, it's almost like we're trying to hype it. Well, I've been, I've listened to every message from this conference if God was moving in this conference, I don't know what he was moving doing because the scriptures were obliterated. 
I mean, young people were being manipulated. It was, there was nothing godly about it. We have some weird way of perceiving or, or, or pretending that God is moving and God is doing something when God is nowhere near it. And maybe it was nothing more than you, that like, you know, you, 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 you dim the lights, you play soft music, someone sings a, a worship song and tells an emotional story and people start weeping and people will be like, the spirit of God was moving. God, w-. no, your emotions were manipulated. Like, like, you know, it's like if, 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 if Christians create the perfect environment to get everyone's emotions going, we say the spirit was moving. If someone was sitting in a dark movie theater and they start crying or laughing, do they say the spirit of God was moving? No, the, the, the movie, the setting, the situation, it touched my emotions. The same techniques are used by the church, but whenever we get people's emotions flowing, we're like, it was God moving. God. And I, and I, I don't know what we, we love to spiritualize everything. It's so weird how Christians do that. It's like it, it's so, and everything, you know, it doesn't matter what God was moving. God was moving. God was moving. We had a hundred people. So now numbers mean God was moving. It, it, it's so just, I, 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 we, 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 you talk about taking the name of God in vain. I think Christians take the name of God in vain because we place, we, we accredit something to God and we place God there and we act like we're doing something for God when in reality, God is nothing, it has nothing to do with any of it. So I, I know that that's going to make me very unpopular. But when, when you're, when you're going to stand at the last night of this youth conference and say, God has been moving, you're out of your mind. No, there's not, God could not be a part of any of it. It's been an absolute abomination is what it's been, but okay. Okay. I, I digress. I'm going to back that up just a little bit. All right, here we go. I'm just, I'm going to start right back from the beginning. Here we go. My heart is full and, um, it's like we work for a long time and then we come to this night and, uh, the Lord's already done so much. I'm not sure what all I can add, uh, if anything, but we believe Jesus wants to continue the work that he's started. And uh, before we get into the message, I do want to thank uh, my wife, who's all the way in the back, back there. Minda, would you raise your hand? And uh, I mean, we, we're, we're, we're t- 34 seconds into what will be a one hour and 17 minutes of who knows what, and we're already getting the cracked voice. What a, what a thing my wife is in back. Okay. All right. Now it may be genuine emotion. It may be genuine emotion, but I just feel like so much of what happens in youth conferences is emotional manipulation. I just really do. So it's already crazy that we're 34 seconds in and there's already tears flowing. There's already cracked voices. There's already crying because he's thinking his wife, who's all the way there in the back. What is he going to thank her for? Here we go. And I just, I, just I, you, I know this, you can thank your wife in private. You don't have to make a public spectacle of it, but okay. Okay. All right. Here we go. She's behind the scenes often. <laughs> One time pastor asked me to preach here at the church and, and I was so excited. I mean, I was- man, he went from crying to perfectly. Okay. I know. I know I'm being cynical. I know I'm being cynical. No, I'm being cynical. No, I'm being cynical. Okay. I know I'm being cynical. All right. Okay. Stop it. Stop. It, it's just, I've reached such a, a frustrated point with this. At, at uh, we, We've listened to so much, but okay. So that probably wasn't, I, I, I take that back. All right. Let's just go with everything is genuine here. Everything's honest. Everything is upright. Let's go with that. I apologize. But yeah, you can hear my frustration with this. It's just, I feel like, I feel like everything they're doing is, is it, it's just, ugh, there's just so much that's been wrong in this youth conference. So I take that back. I take that back. When you react in real time, it's always a danger. Sometimes you say something before you should, before you should have. We'll wait and we'll, we'll let my judgment happen at the end of whatever I think is, is going on here in this message. Here we go. But I do get excited. I was so excited and I was in the kitchen telling my wife, man, I, I don't know what I'm going to preach. I've got these thoughts of five thoughts, and I'm going through all the sermons with her. And 
She finally looked at me. She said, man, honey, that sounds great. She said, choose one of them, preach half of it. <laughs> and, uh, but anyhow, that's a good wife right there, and I'm going to try to obey tonight. But I want to thank her and, and my children who never complain at all. They don't complain at all. All the work and the travel and... Wow, he's got children who never complain. That's... That's pretty amazing. That's pretty amazing. That's, I, I, I like to, uh, I would like to talk to these children. <laughs> they never complain. Okay. I don't think I've ever met an adult who never complains, but okay. Just the busyness of the ministry. They never complain at all. And I want to thank them. I want to thank my friends uh, that are in the room and uh, many youth pastors, pastors, and friends of a lifetime here in the room. My friends who have poured out their heart in, in preaching and that have really just been used of God, all these men. I think of Brother Joe Brown. I was thinking of this on the platform. He's a friend of mine. The first time I ever had a phone conversation with him, very first conversation, he called me. I was in West Virginia, and he called me, and he said, um, Pastor Joe Brown, of course, I had heard of him and had heard of his dad. He said, I'm Pastor Joe Brown, and we want you to come to the Marion Avenue Baptist Church to preach the Our Time Youth Conference, and I was stunned that he would want me to come, and I said, uh, I said, great, I, I'd, I'd be honored, I'd be thrilled, and we kind of talked for a few minutes and, and hung up. Then my phone rang a few minutes later, you remember this, don't you? It rang a few minutes later, he said, wait, wait, wait. I said, what is it? He said, I, I have a rule. He said, I, I don't let anybody preach in the church who I've never heard before. He said, and I've never heard you before. He said, would you send me a a CD or a tape or something, and then we can, we can work it out. And I said, I said, okay. And so I, I hung up and I called Ted Dahl, Ted or Andy, I forget which one. I had just preached at their tournament. And I said, hey, do you happen to have that recording? And we kind of, I didn't have any tapes or CDs or anything. And, and I sent it off to Brother Brown. And then I just waited. Like, what if he doesn't call me back, <laughs> you know? Like, ah, no, never mind. We don't want you to come. <laughs> but he did call, and that was the start of a, of a wonderful friendship. And thank you, Brother Brown, especially for, for this afternoon. What a, great, what a great truth. I want to thank our teenagers who do so much work in, the, in many of the youth groups here, the Spanish teens, the Chicagoland teens. We all pitch in. Our teens do so, so much of the food prep and the midway, and, and uh, I just want to thank them for that. I want to thank our pastor. I love very much for allowing us to have this meeting and for being a, um, just for being the leader, the shepherd of this church, and I want to thank him for it. I've told this story, I've worn it out, but I'm a little nervous, so I'll tell it and then I'll move on. This is going to be the last time I tell a story for a while. It didn't happen too long ago, but, uh, but I've told it everywhere I've been, but it just was so surreal. Speaking of our pastor, I owe a lot to him. I owe a lot to him. Just a few months ago, well, maybe two months ago at the Our Time Youth Conference, I was driving to get to Our Time, and, and it was, um, it was a uh, hectic day, to say the least. I had had a lot of airport difficulty and airport trouble and was here and there, and just the two flights canceled and four flights delayed, and so it was just, it was just a long trip, and I was already late, and, um, and I had gotten a rental car, and I was tired. I hadn't slept much at all, maybe just 30, 35 minutes uh, at the most that whole day because of all the delays. And I was in this rental car and I was, I was driving to Washington, Iowa to be with you. And I'm driving to Iowa and, um, and let's just say that, that if you're a police officer in the room, I'd like for you to, uh, step out and uh, don't pay attention. Let's just say that I was speeding. Okay. And I was doing like a hundred miles an hour and I have this terrible habit that I, I despise seatbelts. And so, uh, you can ask my wife. I mean, I just, I will, I will wait for the beeping to stop. I don't care if it goes for 20 minutes. They're not going to tell me what to do. And, uh, but I despise those seatbelts. And, and so I'm flying down the road, trying to get to Washington, Iowa. I have no seatbelt on. I'm going 100 miles an hour at times. I'm sure it was less than that, but I know at times I was doing 100 miles an hour. And I happened to be uh, periodically texting while I was driving, all right? So that's the big three. I was breaking all the laws. That you- I, I do find it funny that the Bible seems to tell us to obey the laws, 
We break the laws, but we don't ever necessarily perceive it as sin. Like we almost, we joke about it. We joke about it, right? We don't, we don't see it as a sin. Is it a sin to break the laws? Are we not to obey the laws that are placed over us? If we are, then it's a sin, but we don't feel the same conviction of that. Like that, it, we, I, I, I hate the seatbelt laws. I, I, I hate the seatbelt laws. Um, yes, I, I have sped multiple times when I was driving back from Galveston, was it last Saturday, trying to get back home? Yeah, I, I definitely was speeding. But I, I know that it's like, it's a sin, right? So do we see it as a sin? Like, they've been yelling and screaming about all kinds of sins, right? They've been yelling and screaming at the whole youth conference. About, and now here, someone just basically, now he may he may say that it was a sin. I don't know. But it's just weird. I think sometimes, like, there's certain sins that we elevate to mortal, and then there's other sins that are venial. Breaking traffic laws, we don't even view that as a sin. Is it a sin? Is it a sin? I, I could think of some scripture that would seem to clearly indicate that it is. So why do we not feel convicted by that? Why is it not in it? Why is it not a scandal? No scandal. Isn't it weird how some sins are scandalous and some sins are irrelevant? It's just, 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 just a thought. I'm still trying to see where he's going. So what's the point of his story? Still, we don't have a thesis yet for what the sermon is about. We still have an hour and 12 minutes to go. So let's let's see how far we can get into this. You can break. Speeding, no seatbelt, texting. I was texting Brother John Fear from Marion Avenue. I said uh, he was my host, and I, I sent him the text. I still have it on my phone. I said, uh, pray for me. I have a rental car, and I am flying. I mean, I told him that. I am flying. I said, pray I don't get a speeding ticket, uh, but I have liberty about it. I love it how Christians can get away with anything if they add, but I have liberty about it. <laughs> and... Uh, and I had liberty about it, you know, as I was flying, and we came to a road deal. That, that's, he had liberty about it. So, so like, is it not a sin? I, I just find it interesting because, because, again, they've been telling the young people, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't watch movies, you can't listen to secular music, you can't sin, 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 you can't do this, you can't do this, what, what you wear, you got to get rid of certain friends, you all, and then, but this whole story is just a blatant, like, I was, I was breaking all of these laws, so that was sin. Well, so was, does it matter? Is that sin important? Like, I, I just think that this, like, I don't want to spend all the time here, but I am, I, I, I do appreciate in a sense listening to this because it raises the question, why is it that there's some sin that we just don't care about and other sins we do? Why, why is it? Why is it that pornography is one level of sin, breaking all traffic laws is another level of sin? Why is a woman gossiping or a man gossiping one level of sin where a a different kind of sin will be at a completely different level? Some sins, you're disqualified, you're done, you're finished, you should be crucified and never be heard from again. And other sins, it's like, hey, no big deal. You don't even really need to do anything about it. Like, how, why do we, like, how do we, what's our basis on that? Like, who has that rule book? Like, who has the rule book? That sin is the, you know, death penalty. Those sins, no big deal. Who makes the rules? At least within Catholicism, you have for something to be a mortal sin, you have to, it has to do this, 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 and this, and others are venial. At least there is a clear distinction. At least there's a system for you to be able to determine. Within the non-Catholic world, I don't know who gets to make the rules on which, what, this is the sin, and here's the consequences if you commit that sin, if you are a pastor or what. what there, like, who gets to determine the consequences? Who gets to, de- it's just so odd. Like, like because you could argue uh, a pastor is supposed to be blameless, above reproach. Well, he's just in there, they flaunted all the traffic laws. But, well, that's okay. That's okay. That's okay. That's no big deal. Now, I'm not saying, I, I, I'm not saying anything should be done. I'm not saying that. What I'm trying to say is I want us to think about how do we, our, our, our understanding of sin and sinfulness, it's just so, sometimes it fe- feels very subjective. Tour, and, uh, and I had to get off of the, the main road. Now I'm on a gravel road in Iowa. 
I love the state of Iowa. There's a lot of farms there, a lot of gravel roads there, and, uh, and I'm still flying, no seatbelt, texting, talking back and forth to different people, and, and I kid you not, I look up in the middle of the road, I mean, I wasn't doing 100, I was doing like 65 miles an hour, I look up in the middle of the road, and it was like my whole life flashed in front of my eyes, a cow, a big, <laughs> I'm serious, a big Iowa <laughs> a big Iowa dairy cow was just standing in the middle of the road, just standing there, just staring at me. And, and I slam on the brakes of my car. My, I'm fishtailing. I'm freaking out. My life is flashing in front of my eyes. Several things I need to go back and fix. But my life is flashing in front of my eyes. I come within, come within 10 feet of this cow. It didn't move at all. I mean, it didn't move. Get it out. It didn't move at all. It's, it's just staring at me like, you are an idiot. <laughs> and uh, I did stop, and, and again, it, it's goofy, but my heart was pounding. My hands were sweating. I was, I mean, it was, my legs were weak. If you've ever, anybody here ever have a near-death experience, anything like that, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, it just took me a minute to compose myself, and, and uh, literally, literally, just a few feet away in my mind from death, I could see the, the headlines, terrorist attacks Midwestern agriculture. <laughs> I could see it. I could see it. I, I, I composed myself. I, the, cows, the cow never did move, all right? I kind of got around it. Uh, someone, someone else is having a problem as he's making light of breaking all of these in one shot. I know. It, it, I, I try to understand... Because, you know, telling stories, I mean, I love telling stories. I love. And, I, and when I tell stories, I, I, you know, I, what I typically try to do when I tell stories is I try to, I, I use a lot of hyperbole, but I try to make it so clear that I'm using a hyperbole that no one can accuse me of, you know, embellishing or not being accurate because it's obvious I'm being over the top, right? So instead of saying I was going 100 miles, I'd be like, I was going 5,000 miles an hour, right? And the cow was, you know, 10 tons or whatever the case may be. But at the same time, so I do understand that the, 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 I, I, here's what I will say. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm still trying to figure out, uh, to me, it brings up the, the, the issue of why some sins are big and some sins are not, you know, and, and, and it's just, it, it, to me, it's always the odd part, part of Christianity. I go get in my car in a little bit and take off somewhere and break three traffic laws. Nobody cares. But if five minutes later someone finds out that I did this or this or this, it's the end of the world and it's public scandal. And it's just so weird how one thing is horrifying and the other thing is acceptable. It's just weird how that works within the Christian world. So I guess to me what I'm going to say is where is the story going? Like what's the point of the story? Now, he may, it may, he may just be using this more for an illustrative purpose and he's going to have this profound point. But it does like, you know— yeah, yeah, having young people sit there, basically hearing a preacher saying, I broke all of these laws and almost as if it was okay. Um, now, I'm assuming at some point he's going to say, guys, don't, you know, obviously don't do this. But um, I, I'm just interested what the point of the story is. What, 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 like, what, what, like, whenever you preach and you use that opening story, you, you're going to connect it to something. So hopefully there's a good connection here. I, I'm going to wait and see where he goes with this. And, uh, and I had to stop again. I was just, I was just freaking out. And 60 seconds later, my phone rings and, and it's Pastor Wilkerson. You know, Pastor Wilkerson, he's the nicest man on planet earth, literally. And, uh, and I answered the phone. He said, Hey buddy, <laughs> just that gentle, you know, calming, soothing voice. And I needed it cause I was freaking out, but, uh, Hey buddy. I said, Pastor, I almost died. What? <laughs> and, uh, I said, a cow, a cow. I almost hit a cow. And I forget all that he said, the whole conversation, but I think he may, may have said something like, you know, take it low and slow or something. He said something. I, I forget the whole conversation, but I remember this. He said this. He said, Abdel, I knew you were preaching uh, today at some point this afternoon, tonight. He said, I've been praying for you. been praying for you. 
He said, I just decided, you know, see what you were doing. I, I decided to give you a call when I was done praying. I didn't know if you were able to take the call, but I've been praying for you. Man, I'm glad my pastor has a prayer life. So implication, or what he's implying here, or maybe explicitly saying, is the reason he didn't die is because his pastor was praying for him. So if his pastor prayed for everyone, then nobody would die. Is, is that, I'm, I'm, I was praying for you. So, the, so like, is that the implication here? He didn't die because someone was praying for him. So all I got to do is pick people, pray for them, and they will never die. They will never be in a car accident, never die of cancer. Like, I, 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 I look, I know Christians get irritated when I do these kinds of things, but I always take these things to some kind of a logical conclusion. What are you implying? The other people who died that day, nobody was praying for them. So Christians should quit our jobs. We should just live in a church going through a directory of people in our city praying for them and have people at the church praying around the clock 24-7 and then nobody would die. No, 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 no. That's not what he's saying. Okay, then what's the point of the story? What's the point of the story? Let's see if he, if he drives the, the point home. We had a brief conversation. I hung up the phone, and I did think to myself, could it be that I was a prayer away? A prayer away from death. Could it be? A prayer away from death. What, what, what does that mean? Where is this going? Is this going to go, hey, teenagers? You are a prayer away from dying. You better get right with God. Is that, is that where this is going? I, I, don't, I don't know. Just a prayer away. I wonder if we're sitting here tonight, I wonder how many of you, you're a sermon away. You're an invitation away. You're just 45 minutes or so away from a pinnacle moment, a, de a decision that would determine everything. I got to Iowa, got there safely, and uh, still when I arrived, I was nervous. I was still just... Re I'm just going to be honest with you. It's hard how he can go into like, it sounds like he's about to cry and coming right back out of it strong. He comes in like, like you almost hear the voice and a boom, he comes right back out of it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm just, 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 maybe that's just the way he is, but all right. Okay. Now it is true that we're all moments away from death. We never know when it's going to happen. That, that is absolutely true. I got no problem saying that. I don't know about a prayer away, but I think I know what he's trying to say. A moment away from death. We don't know when it's going to happen. It could be today, could be tonight, could be tomorrow. That is true. That is true. All right, let, let's see where this is going to go. He still has a long ways to go in this sermon. I mean, that has such an impact on you. And I walked into the church immediately. I don't know who it was. I wish I knew who it was. But I walked into the church immediately, and somebody said, Brother Judah, how are you doing? One of the laymen in the church. And I said, I said, uh, I said, good. I said, actually, not really. I said, man, I am freaked out. He said, what? I said, I almost died. He said, how? I said, I almost ran into a cow on a detour road. He said, oh, yeah, was that road so and so? He knew where the cow was. I said, yes, please, go move it. And this is what he said. He said, he said, uh, he said, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. You would have been gone. He said, that, that would have killed you. He said, last time that happened. <laughs> and I'm thinking, last, uh, what is going on in Iowa that we need to know about? But <laughs> they knew I was coming, strategically placed. No, but they said, he said, last time that happened, when that happened last time, he said, I knew a man that the, they hit a cow like that. It went through the winter. It decapitated him. Now try preaching after that, brother. I got thinking, man, that, you know, could you imagine, and just my weird mind, could you imagine going to heaven, and, and I'm there instantaneously to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord, and I'm there, and I'm there, and there, maybe there's a, a believer from some uh, uh, persecuted country, you know, and, and, and obviously, they'd given their life and service, maybe an underground church or something, and they'd given their life. And then maybe I would come across somebody who, who was just a saint of God, and 
got a disease and was faithful to the end and witnessing to people, you know, as they body was racked in a hospital and they look at me and how'd you get here? <laughs> like a cow. I was, <laughs> I was, <laughs> was speeding on a road in Iowa. Long story now, but anyways, how many of you come from a, I guess the point of the story is that we could all die. Okay. Is that going to be, is that the thesis of the sermon that we could all die at any moment? Okay. I mean, that's a pretty standard, if, that, if, if that's the direction he's going to go, right? I, I'm still trying to figure it out. Still trying to figure it out. Let, let's see. Come from a good Christian home. Would you raise your hand? Good Christian home. Good Christian home. Leave your hands up. How many of you would say, I, I um, have a good pastor, good church, youth pastor, bus captain, People, people, how many of you leave your hands up? But, but here's what I'm saying. I always find it funny. Just again, just my not fitting into the world of Christianity. Everyone raises, people raise their hand, a good church, a good pastor until they disagree. And then it's not a good church or a good pastor. They move on. And then the next church they're at is a good church and a good pastor until they don't like that one. And then they go to another one and then it's a good church and a good pastor until they move on to the next. Okay. All right. Um, <laughs> someone just made the joke. Uh, hopefully they all kept their hands down for that one. Well, yeah, for, for yeah, I, I, yeah. Anyone who brought him to this conference. Yeah. But okay. Yeah, I, I agree. All right. Let's see where he's going to go though. Let's see where he's going to, I just do find it interesting that I, I, I always make the joke as in my ministry and my life that anyone who says like, yeah, I love your teaching. You're a great teacher. Oh man, you're an amazing teacher. I always joke that those are usually the first people who turn on you and then like you're garbage and I don't like you and I'm going to find another church. Sometimes the people who are loudest with their praise are the quickest to leave you and to turn their back on you and walk away. Um, I've, I've, I've caught on to that really quick in my ministry. So now when people give me uh, compliments, I'm just like, okay, well, thank you. Uh, you'll be gone next week. Right? I, mean, I mean, that's real. I, I know that's, that's very cynical, but sometimes it feels that way. Sometimes the people who compliment you the most are the people who'll turn on you the quickest. Not, I know that that's not always the case, obviously, but, um, but it's just sometimes you feel that way that, that, Hey, yeah, you're great until you're not, until you're not, you're great until, you start teaching something I disagree with, and then you're done. And rarely do those people give you the opportunity to sit down with a notebook of all of the work they've done on the subject and to work with you to work through to figure out where the disagreement is. But, you know, that's the way it works. That's ministry. Let's continue. There, there are good people, Brother Judah, in my life. Good people in my life. Well, this message is for you tonight. Would you put your hands down, turn to Job chapter number one. Oh boy. Okay, so we're going to Job. Hmm, that's an interesting Ill opening illustration to get us to the book of Job. It really is. But okay, to so the book of Job chapter one, just, just so that you know, if you ever say that, well, if anyone knows me and says that, hey, I've got a good person in my life, that guy from the Theology Central podcast, He's a good guy in my life. I am not a good guy in your life, all right? Just so that you know that I'm a sinner in your life, okay? I'm a sinner in your life. Um, I, I think we always say someone's a good person in my life until, well, they demonstrate that they're a sinner. I, I tend to view all people as sinners. I have sinners in my life. I have sinners in my life because that's what we all are. We all are. So whatever good quote unquote we have can turn bad in 5.2 seconds. But okay, that's, that's, that's a whole different, I know my, I, I tell you, I have a very negative outlook on everything, don't I? All right, but here we go. Just so that you know, don't think that, hey, that person on the Theology Central podcast, that's a good, no, not a good person, not a good person, not a good person. No, no. All right, here we go. So book of Job, I get nervous. I get nervous, but okay. I, I'm still trying to figure out how the opening illustration gets us to Job. Maybe because the, the children die here, right? His children die. Maybe that's why. I, I don't know. Job chapter number one in our Bible. And let's stand together for the reading of the word of God. I'm going to read an unusual passage here in the beginning. I don't understand it all, but we'll read it. 
And we'll get to our text verse. The Bible says in verse number 6, this is a message that God has placed on my heart here in the last couple of months. The go-to, God has placed this message on my heart. God has placed this because now that uh, immediately lays the psychological foundation for my message came from God, so therefore you should listen to it, therefore you should not question it, therefore you should not challenge it. I'm telling you, I need to start using that for every one of my sermons. God gave me this message. How dare you disagree with me? But okay, um, I I don't do that. Um, I always say that I, the message came from my study. <laughs> that's that's where it came from. That, that's where, I know that's not so very, it doesn't sound near as exciting, does it? God placed this on my heart. I need you to hear me. Or uh, I was, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this and a lot of time studying it. I, I don't know. Wh- which one works better? I don't know. That's 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 another whole thing. But all right, here we go. I'm worried. Job chapter one, verse six. I, ad- I admire the fact that he acknowledged he doesn't understand everything about it because there's a lot in the book of Job no one understands. But when he says their text verse, that means he's going to read some, probably a, a ignore everything, and then focus on the wording of one verse. I'm a little nervous. I still don't know what the opening illustration is. The opening story had to do with this, but let's see. Here we go. I believe it's a message for our generation. I really do. I believe it's a message certainly for the teenagers and the adults in this room, but God's just placed it on my heart for such a time as this, as I've been privileged to to think about it and to preach it. Job chapter 1, verse number 6, the Bible says, There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, And Satan came also among them. The Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. The Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? That there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast not thou made an hedge about him and about his house? about all that he hath on every side, thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Understand, he went forth, stay standing, leave your Bibles open. But he left the presence of God with one mission, and that was to destroy and discourage and defeat a good man named Job. He unleashes every allowable tactic, everything that God the Father would allow, Satan unleashes on this man Job. Let's read it in verse number 13. There is a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house, and there came a messenger unto Job and said the oxen were plowing, the asses feeding beside them, and the Sabians fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. And while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God has fallen from heaven, hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. And while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels, and have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. And while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine, in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head, and fell down upon the ground and worshipped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And in all this Job said not, nor charged God foolishly. I want to draw your attention tonight to verse number 19. Verse number 19. Where the Bible says, And behold, 
there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house. And it fell upon the young men. They are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. I want to preach a message to you tonight. No real title, but if I had to title it, it would be a satanic whirlwind. A satanic whirlwind. And let's all right, here we go. We're going, they, they, they have definitely emphasized Satan, 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 which is kind of interesting. Uh, someone today posted an article um, about the, the, like the new wave of the satanic panic. If you remember in the 80s, if, if you don't remember, if you've read about it or watched Stranger Things on Netflix, they, they, they borrowed from this. There was called the Great Satanic Panic of the 1980s, which was insanity to live through, insanity to read about. Some say we're going through the same thing right now in 2022, that the satanic panic is back. Well, this conference, they've, man, they have, like, everyone is demon-possessed. Satan is everywhere. They, they, they've definitely gone with it. I don't know if he's going to do the same thing. I'm, I'm still perplexed at the opening story. Was the opening story just like an icebreaker to try to get people laughing? I don't know what it really has to do with this, but maybe. So he's going to go with the idea. Now, a satanic wind that's that's trying to kill young people. Let's let's see. I I I, I don't know if he's gonna. I don't think he's gonna try to explain much about Job. I think he's just gonna take this phrase and just run with it. And we could talk about the right and wrongness of that. But let's let's at least we'll judge the. I'll try to judge the message based off the content, not maybe how he he's ripping these verses out of context. Who knows? Maybe he's gonna put it in context. We'll wait and see. Pray, Father, I pray that you would please bless this message. Lord, simple thoughts, would you please empower them? God, would you please help it to build on this afternoon's messages and on the work that you've already begun in so many hearts, God? Would you make this evening just give it a divine capstone like only you can? And we'll thank you for it, God. I believe in this generation, I believe that the hope of so much is right right here. It's right here. Because of that, there's an incredible target. And the people in this room, especially the young men and the young ladies, help us to listen, Lord. I pray that you'd eliminate distractions, but God, my prayer as it always is, as I preach to the ear, God, please, would you preach to the heart? Accomplish your work in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. You can be seated, but please. All right, so basically 18 minutes of that was intro. And now he's got an hour to uh, preach the sermon. So here we go. Sit back. We're not going to be able to, obviously, we're not going to be able to review at all. We're at 48 minutes already. So we're not going to get, I almost want to stop right there. But we'll, we'll at least let him get into the sermon and try to find a good stopping point. Here we go. Leave your Bibles open to Job chapter number one. Job is a good man. Those of you that raised your hand and said, I have a good parent, good mom and dad, good youth pastor, good pastor back home. Those of you that identified there, I want you to know that if Job's children were in the room, if they were here at youth conference, they would raise their hand and they would no doubt think about Job and Job's wife, and they would say, yeah, yeah, man, I've got a good set of parents, and just like you, Satan sets his sights on Job. He wants to defeat Job. He wants to defeat this good man. By the way, we're at youth college. Whoa, 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 slow down, slow down. Satan sets his eyes on Job? Satan? Let's let's remind ourselves how the story went. There was a man in the country of Uz named Job. He was a man of complete integrity who feared God, turned away from evil. He had seven sons and three daughters. His estate included 7,000 sheep 
and goats, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large number of servants. Job was the greatest man among all the people of the East. I'm just reading from the Bible right here next to me. His sons used to take turns having banquets at their homes. Uh, They would send an invitation uh, to their three sisters to eat and drink with them. Whenever a round of banqueting was over, Job would send for his children and purify them, raising early in the morning to offer burnt offerings for all of them. For Job thought, perhaps my children have sinned, having cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular practice. One day, the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. And the Lord asked Satan, where have you come from? From roaming through the earth, Satan answered him and walking around on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? No one else on earth is like him, a man of perfect integrity who fears God and turns away from evil. Satan answered the Lord, does Job fear God for nothing? God is the one who points Job out. God is the one who points it out. God is the one who instigates this. God is the one who sets this up. Don't preach this like Satan shows up to God and it's like, hey, 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 hey. I really want to go after this good guy. I really want to go after this wonderful man. I really, I want to target this good person because I hate good people. Let me have him. Let me have him. Let me have him. No, the story is God's like, hey, Satan, hey, right there, Job, Job, have you considered him? Let's talk about him. God points Job out to Satan. So let's not twist this. Let's not mess this up. One of the things this conference has bothered me, has made me so frustrated with is that they will take a text and make it say something completely opposite to what the text actually says. The story here, God was in a sense thinking about Job. God is the one who points Job out to Satan. God is the one who instigates this. God is the one who sets this up. If you don't get that part of the story right, you're misrepresenting the book of Job. This wasn't like Satan was walk, walking around like, ooh, look at Job. He's like standing in the backyard or, you know, late at night in the bushes looking through the windows. You know, the, 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 the sinister presence, he's watching Job. And he's like, ooh, I don't like good people. I hate good people. I despise good people. I know what I'll do. I'll go tell God, give me Job. Give me, come on, let me have a little bit. Let me, let me do this. And God's like, okay, I'll let you do it. No, that's not the way it went down. If that's the way you're preaching it, that's a misrepresentation. I'm not saying he is, but I'm getting a little nervous. I'm going to back that up just a little bit. I've heard too many sermons that does that exact kind of thing and presents this as like, this is all Satan's idea. No, this is God's idea. Yeah, man, I've got a good set of parents, and just like you, Satan sets his sights on Job. He wants to defeat Job. He wants to defeat this good man. By the way, we're at youth. See, he's making this Satan wanted set his sights. Satan wanted to defeat Job. We don't know what Satan wanted. Satan was just showing up and God's like, hey, hey, right there, right there, right there, right there. God set it up, obviously knowing what Satan's response was going to be. God is controlling this. God is instigating this. God is the one doing this. You could say God set his sight on Job. Conference, we often preach to you and talk about the teenagers, but just for a moment, uh, think with me about your mom and dad, about your pastor, about your youth pastor. You realize that Satan would want nothing more uh, than to defeat them. He sets his eyes on. The story would be God would want to defeat me. <laughs> God is the one who set this up. It's, it's amazing what, what, what Christians do to the word of God. Job and he begins to have this conversation with God and we know something God began to have a conversation with Satan he's flipping this that Satan is the one instigating this no God instigated it God had a conversation with Satan Satan didn't show up to have a conversation with God Satan showed up and God had a conversation with him let's not get this twist let's let's handle this correctly Oh, I'm getting nervous now. I'm getting really nervous now. Here we go. That Satan doesn't know. 
Because we have the whole Bible and because we've read the whole story, we know, we know something here that Satan doesn't know. We know that he'll have another opportunity to defeat Job, but he doesn't know that. And so he, he takes every opportunity. He unleashes every allowable tactic. He destroys his wealth and he destroys his servants and he, he wrecks so much of his life. And then, believe it or not, Satan, who does not play fair. Wait a minute. He only does what God allows him to do. God set this up. Satan is just the tool in the story. Right? I mean, Satan, Satan is completely controlled here. He know, he's only doing what God allows him. God set the whole thing up. God instigated the whole thing. How do we flip this story? It is bizarre to me how preachers preach the book of Job. This, we've, oh, okay, all right, let, let's see where he's going to go. In an effort to defeat Job, a good man, he looks at his children. He sets a target on Job's children. And he says, I'll visit their house. By the way, young people, say, did he say I will visit their house? Now you don't, don't start putting words into the mouth of the characters in the story that are not in the story. No, we got it. Now I know as preacher, I've done it. We've all done it. All preachers have done it because we read the story and when we start preaching it, we start, we start embellishing a little bit. We start adding to it to, for dramatic purposes. So it's like, you know, okay, okay, what can I do? So here's Satan. What can I do? Oh, I know. I'll go for the children. Okay. Maybe he said that. Maybe he didn't say that. Stick with the text. Just remember, if Satan kills the children, God allowed it. God set it up. Satan will attack the young. Look at verse number 19. It says, There came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house and look at it, and it fell upon the young men. These are Job's children, his family. The Bible says, and they are dead. It has long been a tactic of our enemy to discourage and derail even the best Christians by targeting uh, their family, by attacking their children, by getting into the home and getting into your world in an effort uh, to defeat these good people. I've known preachers who... And this happened because God set it up. He, he clearly is just avoiding that obvious reality of this story. Of compromise and in some cases quit altogether because while they stood strong, somehow, some way, Satan got into the home. He got into the children and before you knew it, uh, the children were gone or they went hard left or whatever. And even preachers have uh, quit or compromised. I've known good parents. Now, okay, let's follow your illustration. How did Satan get into the home of Job? God allowed it. God set it up. I'm going to repeat that 500,000 times. Listen to me, young people. This message, it is for you, but it's for your mom and dad and your pastors back as much as it's for you. I've known good parents who had decades of faithful service and, and who loved God and were everything, not perfect, but everything that they, they should have been. And I've seen Satan get into teenagers' lives and enter into the home. And Okay, now... You're using Job to preach this. How does Satan get to the children? God allowed it. You're taking this story and now going to say, how did Satan get into your home and to your children? Parents, you failed them. 
But if the children aren't regenerate, Satan is already in them because they are born children of the devil. They have a depraved nature. So in a sense, the devil is already in them. Satan doesn't get into the home. He's already in the home because every member of that family has a depraved nature. So one, he's completely using the story of Job in an opposite way that it actually reads. And two, he's implying that somehow we can keep Satan out of the home. I'm pounding my chest. He's already inside of us because we have a depraved nature. Next thing you know, good parents are discouraged. I've seen them. Sinful parents are discouraged. Separate. I've seen them get divorced and and it started in the home. It started in their heart, which has a depraved nature. I I th- this this is it's it's insanity how we can't stay true to biblical theology when it comes to human depravity and the reality of a sinful nature. Christianity always like that sin is out there and we just gotta keep it from getting in here. And when I say that that was sinful nature, uh, sinful parents who got discouraged, I'm not saying they're sinful because they got discouraged. What I'm trying to say is when you say good parents, there's no one good. In a practical way, we're all sinners. No, we're good in our position with the imputed righteousness. I was just saying that they were sinners because all parents are sinners. Those who get discouraged and those who don't get discouraged. I want to make sure no one misrepresents what I was saying there. I think you understood that. But this he's he's destroying the, the, the reality of sinful nature, destroy, clearly coming at it from a Pelagian perspective, I guess. And then he's clearly, who will completely utterly uh, turning the book of Job upside down because it was God who set all of this up. It was God who allowed it. It started when Satan, who hates us, but teenager, he doesn't just hate us. He hates God. Do you understand that? When Satan said, he doesn't play fair. When, when he said, okay, okay, they're strong. I'll go after the young people. Is that what he said? Is that, did you, did, did you, do you have a recording of the conversation that I'm missing? Do you have some extra verses in your Bible? They're strong. I'll go after their children. Is, is that, is that, where, where did you read that? Where, where did you read that? Where did you read that? satanic whirlwind look at verse number 19 the bible says came a great wind from the wilderness and look at what it says it smote the four corners of the house you see the whirlwind there all around job's house all around the young people in the house the four corners the four posts this wind was swirling this wind that came from satan that was an effort uh, to destroy and to defeat it was on the four corners of the house all around it hard to keep up hey isn't that the way it is with temptation isn't that the way it is isn't that how how the devil works Uh, it is all around us i'm a parent and as much as i try to safeguard as much as i try to keep worldly influences out of the house man it's like everywhere you turn i mean it's coming the worldly influence is inside the house your children was born with it it's called depravity And remember, Satan does this because God allowed it and God set it up. It's everywhere. Satan's the prince of the power of the air. I don't have to say to you, Brother Brown said it well enough. I mean, every, I jotted some things down. Uh, He's in our, he's in our uh, internet. He's in our, our phone, our social media. Satan is in our internet. Well, then don't use it. There you go. But Cain killed Abel before the internet. Sodom and Gomorrah existed before the internet. Hmm. Israel sacrificed their children before the internet. 
hmm, I wonder, I wonder how that happened. I wonder, I wonder how it happened. Even our cartoons today, the satanic attack, uh, this whirlwind, uh, places like TikTok and Disney and streaming services and even commercials everywhere you look on the billboards, in our music, uh, in our culture, all of it, teenager, watch this, all of it is on purpose, all of it is, all of it is by design, it is all targeted at you in an effort to collapse the house. Don't know how what this has to do with the book of Job in any way, shape, or form. It's an actual wind in the book of Job. Now he's turning it into an allegorical wind, that it's a wind of the satanic plot to destroy young people by culture. The young people are destroyed by depravity. It's inside of them. Why can we never figure this out as Christians? Why can we never figure this out as the church? It's always going to be a satanic plot to destroy us. It's got to be this. It's this. It's this. It's this. It's this. No. You want to know where the problem is? Okay. Don't look to TikTok. Don't look to Disney. Don't look to cartoons. Don't look to music. Look in the mirror. Hard to keep out. It's all. You can't keep it out because it's already in. It's called the sinful nature. Almost like there's not enough walls you can put up to keep the wind from swirling around the house. Satan's not playing games. He's looking, teenager, to collapse your life. He's looking to collapse your future. He's looking to collapse your family. He's looking to collapse your friends. He's looking to collapse your youth group. He's looking to collapse your church. He's not playing games. Well, if you're using the book of Job to prove your point, it's God trying to collapse your house. God is the one, God is the one instigating this in the story. How can you, how can you ignore that that point of the story? God is the one who's doing this. If you're going to use this, you're going to use the book of Job to prove your point. God is trying to destroy you. God is using Satan to bring you down. God is the one who's going to use Satan to destroy your family, destroy your youth group. God is, you you would have to preach it that way if you're going to be consistent with the book of Job. How can you take it from Job and then completely ignore Job? God is the one doing, God is the one setting it up. Wow. Somebody once said, we'll stop right there. Someone once said, we'll start, we'll stop right there. 24, 13, 24, 13. We're 24 minutes into the sermon, and all that we've seen is he completely is destroying the book of Job. That's what he's, and, he, and completely destroying the doctrine of human depravity. Wow. This is going to be a long and bumpy road, is what this is going to be, trying to make it through this. It is really, it's going to be, but we're an hour and seven minutes. I don't want this to go any longer. Took us an hour and seven minutes to review 24 minutes. We talked about very, very, very important things. But the two important things is, and I want you to remember this, Job is a book. It's a story where God instigates the entire situation. God instigates it. God controls it. God allows it. And that we can't keep the world out because the world is already in us via our sinful nature. All right. I would love to get your thoughts on what we just heard. Email them to me. Newsif at yahoo.com. Newsif at yahoo.com. Newsif at yahoo.com. And those who are in the Discord channel, can't wait to get your thoughts on what we just heard because it's always interesting uh, your observations uh, from these youth, uh, con- the, the youth conference messages get the most discussion in the Discord channel. They, I think, they get the most um, because I think everyone has very strong reactions because it's crazy. But uh, I hope uh, we can correct some people's misunderstanding of the Book of Job. That may be the whole point of what we're gonna, how we're gonna end this, is just trying to get people to understand the Book of Job correctly. 
All right, but 24 minutes, 13 seconds is where we stop. We have 53 minutes and 41 seconds left, and we'll get to that sometime today. Thanks for listening. Again, email me, newsif at yahoo.com. Yeah, the Word of God. It's amazing how it's not rightly handled uh, from pulpits all across the country. God bless.